You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hi, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome back for episode 36 of the Common Descent Podcast. A nice square number. Yeah. Today, we will be discussing a important to- topic for today's environmentalists, reefs. 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 We're going to be discussing this topic because there's a couple of cool things about reefs. First and foremost, we're going to be discussing what a reef is because it's not just coral reefs. And we're going to go into that in detail. And we're going to go through all the animals that have formed reefs in the variety of types of reefs and uh, what we see in reefs today. Most of us already know that reefs are incredibly important for biodiversity as well as other other habitat maintenance, but we'll be discussing those things and we'll also discuss a little bit about the current status of reefs today. And so we'll be going through that. So this is this is not a coral reef episode. I want to start that from the beginning because Yes, reefs, the, 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 the concept of reefs, like forest. Even when I was taking notes, I had to remind myself of that from time to time because I'd be going through and I was like, no, I don't need to do, go into all the different kinds of coral. <laughs> this isn't a <laughs> coral episode, but it's really easy to do that. And so it it's easy for us to forget that there's more than just coral reefs. This subject was actually suggested to us by one of our listeners. Carly on Facebook requested this. Thanks, Carly, for a really cool suggestion. Indeed, I was I was very excited to to put this episode together. So yes. another one of those that we might not have thought of. Yeah, I, on our own. I don't think I would have thought to do reefs. You know, I don't think I, I to do the concept of reefs. That that's something that I liked that it was that concept instead of just corals. So yeah, this is a fun one. Before we move on, a couple of announcements. First and foremost, an exciting announcement. Because as many of you who have listened to us before know, when people sign up to be patrons on our Patreon page, if they uh, enter at a certain level or higher, they get a shout out. And today we are here to shout out at Dylan for becoming one of our newest patrons. Welcome, Dylan. Welcome to the to the common descent. We we humbly accept your patronage. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> We're happy happy always to have more people. To, yes. to, always happy to shout out names on the podcast. So if you want to hear your name shout out, uh, shouted out on one of the episodes, go ahead and give our Patreon a look. Links are all over all our stuff. Next announcement, this is a little side announcement because we were actually contacted by one of our listeners for an event coming up. This month, there is an event called CrocFest, Summer CrocFest 2018. And Brandon, one of our listeners who's actually working with the event to get the word out there, contacted us to, A, remind us, because I've obviously had my eye on this event before, and I hope to make it there. We'll see what my budget says. Yes. This is a fundraising event. Uh, There's tons of stuff that goes on with it. Lots of crocodile-related events and crocs to see. This one is taking place at Wild Florida, uh, which has uh, alligators and uh, other reptiles to be seen there. And the funds go to some aspect of crocodile conservation uh, or research or efforts to, to you know further promote crocodilian knowledge or uh, care. That's a very cool event. It's very, it's very cool. This one is going to the Colombian crocodiles, uh, specifically, as they say, to rediscover Cayman crocodilus Aparensis, which is a subspecies of the spectacled caiman uh, that they are trying to re-identify in a certain area to hopefully be able to better protect that area if it is found there. It's going to be June 30th at Wild Florida in Kennensville, Florida. And so feel free to give that a look. See, we'll put links in the blog post and stuff if you guys are curious to give it a look. Hopefully you can go. I really hope so. It's not too far from me, and it's it's not there. It's not an expensive ticket to go. I just have to make sure that I've already gotten groceries and stuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and our final announcement, which isn't really announcement, but I guess a reminder at this point, 
our first episode of our Jurassic Park special mini series has been released. So if any of you are interested to hear our scientific musings on the film Jurassic Park and soon to come its sister films. Yes, all the films in the Jurassic Park franchise are female. Yes, yes, they are. We engineer them that way. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing a new episode every Saturday in June, ending with our initial reactions. Yes. For Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom at the end of the month. Absolutely. So keep an eye out for those. Those will be popping up every week. Indeed, they will. And announcement's over. Done. So next step, as you all remember, is every episode we like to cover some recent news when it comes to scientific research and discoveries and findings to kind of keep ourselves and you, the listeners, up to date on what's happening in the scientific world and community. So, David, why don't you take it away? I sure will. My first bit of news... As I love, I always like bringing news that regards a group of animals we haven't talked about on the podcast before. Yes. In this case, bone-crushing dogs. <laughs> nice. This is a study by Xiaoming Wang et al. in eLife, which just recently came out. And there is an article that we'll link in the blog post on live science, written by Mindy Weisberger. Barophagene dogs are an extinct group of dogs, different from the canines that we have today, that were famous for these very unusual skulls and teeth. They had these really robust, strong molars and premolars that had heavy wear on them from chewing up hard stuff. Their skulls were built to withstand large stresses. And for a long, long time, researchers have found that they compare very well with modern-day hyenas. The, the modern-day champs of bone crushing. Yes, hyenas today are specialized. Their skulls and teeth are specialized for cracking bone, which is a great ecological strategy because it means you can get to nutrients that most of your other animals in your environment can't get to. And boy, are their premolars terrifying because of it. Yes, well, they've got these ridges all over their, their like the top oh, yeah. of their skull, their Sagittari sag sag <laughs> their Sagittarius crest. Sagittarial crest. <laughs> <laughs> their sagittal crest on the top of their head is huge for those jaw muscles. And we see similar features in Barophagene dogs. And Barophagenes lived from over 30 million years ago right up until about 2 million years ago, right? The onset of the Pleistocene Ice Age cycle. But... As is so often the case in paleontology, this is an inference from indirect evidence. We're looking at features on the skull and making our best guess at what those were for. And we've been pretty confident. I don't think there have been many people who have taken issue with the notion that these had strong jaws and were very good for probably for bone crushing. But this new study provides some direct evidence in the form of poop. <gasps> Yay! Ancient pup poop. This study looked at 14 coprolites, fossilized feces, more on that, episode 30, <laughs> from the Merton Formation in California, which comes from around 5 to 6 million years ago. Based on their size and shape, these coprolites are thought to have come from a wolf-sized carnivore. And in this area, the only wolf-sized carnivores that were around were a barophagene dog called barophagus, which means that these are our first potential window into the diet of a barophagene dog, the first coprolites associated with a barophagene dog. And wouldn't you know it, they're full of bone. This is one of those awesome moments where we've made these inferences and we're pretty sure about them, and then we get a whole other avenue of evidence that helps to confirm it. The researchers did micro-CT scanning, which is microscopic x-ray scanning, of the poops and found bone fragments and splinters. On average, bone made up 5% of the mass of the coprolites. Mm -hmm. A lot of the bones were ground up into tiny little splinters, but a few of them were large enough for them to identify what kind of animals they came from. Ouch. And they found, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not a great poop, not the best poop. <laughs> that's why mom said chew your food <laughs> <laughs> that's 
They found bones from birds, as well as small and large mammals, including beaver, which is pretty cool. But the fact that the bones are still sort of fragmentary instead of powdery, which is what we see in modern-day spotted hyenas, suggests that while the, the dogs were good at crunching bone, they weren't as good at digesting bone. Very interesting. Modern hyenas kind of poop out bone paste, whereas striped and brown hyenas and modern-day wolves aren't quite as good at that. So they, their poo, when they swallow bone, you end up with bone chunks coming out in the poo. So this gives us insights into what these dogs were actually doing with their crazy jaws, how they were digesting bone, and the fact that these poops were found, several of them in the same spot, appears to be a communal latrine, which is something we see in dogs today, where you do where you have social use of the same area for dropping your poops. Hyenas do this too. And so the authors of this study are suggesting that not only were these dogs possibly eating like modern hyenas, but they were possibly being social and territorial the way that modern hyenas are as well. Very cool. That's super interesting. It's I, I love the the difference between the bone fragments and the poop. Because you see that bone powder in lots of animals today. The snakes and crocs both, you know, just powderize bone when they digest it. So it's yes. really cool to see that that, that there might have been a, a process. You know, had these dogs gone on longer, they may have gotten better at digesting or something. That's a cool comparison between the, the super efficient hyenas of today and the the bone crunching dogs. It's also really, really cool bonus finding that they they may have been very social, which makes sense for dogs. That's a very common thing among dogs today and yes. in general, but still cool to find evidence of it. It's always exciting to get more evidence for another thing. Like we, we make so much of our inferences on prehistoric diet based on skulls and teeth. Yes. It's really nice to get these every now and then to just a little reminder of, hey, by the way, you're, you're doing the skulls and teeth thing right. Yeah. You yeah. were right. You're right about skulls and teeth. Keep doing that. Yes, absolutely. That that's that's it's that nice it's confirmation both of your research but also that the the technique is correct or at least viable. Yes, and then the other thing that I thought was really interesting that they point out is these dogs lived in North America. Hey, which means that they were basically doing the hyena thing in North America, but after they went extinct around the beginning of the Pleistocene, they were not replaced. Yeah. For the last two million years, we have not had bone crunchers here in North America. So this is an extinct, sort of an extinct niche in, mm -hmm. in North American ecosystems that we haven't seen uh, anyone else come in and do this yet. So that's pretty good. That's kind of cool, too. Another one of those things where the the North American plains were very similar to the, those of Africa or grasslands with, with parallel animals feeling, filling similar niches. My first news article, uh, my news articles actually have a theme, and you'll probably pick on, up on it pretty quick. The first news article I have has to do with the ever-famous asteroid that impacted with our little planet at the end of the Cretaceous, causing the KPG mass extinction. Why? Didn't we talk about that in episode 5? I do believe you're correct. Wow. Listeners, go, uh, go confirm that for us. <laughs> yes, you let us know. Uh, direct evidence. The findings of some recent research, this is another case of direct evidence backing up previous hypotheses based on secondary observations. This new research shows that there may have been an extreme period of global warming after the impact for up to 100,000 years. Ooh, we mentioned that, that that has been suggested in Indeed. episode 5. This is some... Uh, more solid evidence to support that suggestion. The research we're discussing is by Ken MacLeod et al., published in Science, and the article that I'm reading this from is in The Atlantic by Robison Meyer. The background, big impact, as we're very aware, killed off majority of life at that time, about 75% of all species have been estimated to have gone extinct due to this event and potentially other events going on on the planet at the time. Once again, check out our episode on the subject. 
the after effects of this have been studied in great detail. One of the first things that will often be discussed by most things covering this event is that there was a period of cooling due to the amount of uh, debris thrown up into the atmosphere that would have caused basically a nuclear winter effect. Yeah, an impact winter is what sometimes people call it. Exactly. And this would have been a a decent amount of time, but a fairly short period of fairly extreme cooling. This is discussed very, very often. What is discussed less often, and that we did mention, is there has also been suggestions that there may have been a period of global warming after that due to the release of CO2 from the impact. CO2 gets trapped in materials, famously things like you know, ice and even certain rocks can trap CO2. And if they are destroyed or vaporized, it releases the CO2. Yeah, pump all that carbon back up into the atmosphere. And as many of us know, with the dealings we have with uh, our outputs of carbon nowadays, this causes greenhouse effects, which causes global warming. Sure does. Computer models had already showed this to be a likely result of the impact. So it's been a very you know, favorable hypothesis. But now we have some interesting evidence from fossils. So to study global temperatures, one of the most common techniques is to measure heavy and light oxygen atoms in fossils, particularly fossil shells are very yes. popular. So like mollusks and things like that. These types of shells are very rare from this time. So those weren't readily available. Instead, our researchers, our intrepid researchers, turned to fish bones and scales and teeth. A very interesting alternative. Yes. Now, to explain the process that they're using, while studying these fossils, they are able to analyze the amount of certain kinds of atoms inside them. And the two that they're looking at are two variations of oxygen. So Oxygen very commonly can come in a heavy form with 18 neutrons in its nucleus and a lighter form with 16 neutrons, often known as oxygen 18 and oxygen 16. These have a weird relationship with things like bones and shells because while bones and shells are being grown, they have to take in oxygen to mineralize. So they call this oxygen mineralization. So when it gets mineralized into these physical forms, these solid forms, the heavy and light versions get taken up, get used up at different ratios. Yes, because of their weight. Because of their weight. And in most cases, the heavy is preferred before the lighter. So that will get more of the heavy than the lighter. But there's a specific ratio to which they both get absorbed. So you will always have a consistent ratio, but that r ratio is affected by temperature. So it'll be consistent within certain temperature brackets. So hotter temperatures will have a different ratio. Cooler temperatures will have yet another different ratio. And what it typically affects is the warmer it gets, the less of the heavy oxygen it takes. You'll hear these referred to as isotope studies because the different forms of atoms are called isotopes of an atom. These are oxygen isotopes. So isotope ratio studies are comparing the amount of different types to infer all sorts of things, in this case, temperature. Exactly. Now, what they found is they had a, a fairly wide record. I think uh, the article said around 200,000 years coverage for these fish fossils. So not too shabby. Decently close to the impact and ranging for a bit of time. They found that after the impact, they saw a decrease the decrease was enough to indicate a five degrees Celsius increase in ocean temperatures. This would translate to about nine degrees Fahrenheit, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're looking at the whole ocean, that's a lot of temperature increase. Yes, it is. <laughs> and they found that they did not start to see these temperatures return to normal until after about 100,000 years. This is another really great example of confirming something that was already thought from other evidence to be true. And that's one of the things that the research has been praised for by other scientists looking into this subject. One person even said that it was very welcome because they were one of the original ones to uh, hypothesize it. And so they were, oh, very nice. They were happy to see it. <laughs> Some of the major implications of this outside of confirming of the suggestion of global warming is that 
A, if the, this global warming did happen to this degree, then this could have been another major cause for the extinctions that happened during this time. Yes. Climate change is a huge cause of extinctions, especially mass extinctions oftentimes when there's drastic climate change. So this could be another thing to be focused on, uh, especially now that it's gained a boon of evidence. There are still questions to be answered here. And a couple of them are really interesting. The first one is how quickly did the warming begin? Because that would affect its effects on a lot right. of, of the animals in the ecosystem. But the one that I found interesting and that the, the paper really harped on as being the one that is kind of the take-home message for us nowadays is we don't know how much CO2 was released. So we can tell the temperature, but we don't know how much CO2 caused that. Now, some estimates, some projections show that it was a five-fold increase, so not quite five times Yeah, yeah. the amount of normal CO2 in the atmosphere at the time, uh, which is a huge increase. That's massive. Oh, yeah. That's ridiculous. But others have said that there are indications that it could be less, and most of the big reason that that's potentially worrisome is that if it is significantly less, like if it's only two times that's worrisome for today because the only time we've seen co2 increases that come close to what we see there at the kpg impact is in the recent co2 increases yeah, being right caused now. by us so this this is it's important to understand the the, the relationship between the amount of co2 and yes. the temperature change if we find out that it was actually only a two-fold increase that caused that five degree that's going to really change what we had predicted for the changes that we'll have coming up in the near future. Things may get hotter much faster than we realized. So there's, it's this, this is something that people are looking into to try to better understand what we might be experiencing now. This is another one of those reasons that it always uh, throws me off a little bit. when it, You'll hear people refer to the KPG extinction as a bad day. Yeah. And yes, it was a bad day, but it was, it was a bad few hundred millennia. Yes. Is really what is really what happened. The world was knocked out of whack for quite a long time, and that's how you get extinction. You Absolutely. don't get extinction in one day. And that, that really is the biggest misconception. Because, yes, the impact happened on a single day somewhere on the calendar, but then it affected generations of animals. My second bit of news is about a bug. Actually, it's about at least two bugs. <laughs> this is a chunk of Burmese amber reported on by Jason Dunlop et al. in Cretaceous Research and reported upon, uh, studied by those folks, reported on, I'm reading, in Nat Geo by Michael Greshko. This is a piece of Burmese amber that has a tick inside of it that is wrapped up in spider silk. That's so cool. Uh, it's just, the, uh, it's, it's, there's no end to the awesome stuff that is coming out of the Burmese amber seriously deposits these days one of the tough things about studying burmese amber is that so much of it gets caught up in social cultural stuff so there's been a number of research projects recently that have come out that started with researchers just going to the markets and finding interesting amber and having to buy it off the streets this one was donated by a collector to the berlin museum of natural history and when researchers looked inside of it they found this tick which is cool to begin with because fossil ticks are rare in the first place. But also it had all these little threads wrapped all around it, which were either the two major possibilities that the researchers investigated were that this is either spider thread, spider silk, or fungus, right? Fungi grow with hyphae. The tiniest hair net. The tiniest hair net. <laughs> well, by comparing this to decomposing ticks today to see how fungi fung, fungal 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 stuff grows all over them as well as comparing to spider silk they concluded that this is indeed spider silk wrapped intentionally around this tick just like we see spiders do today that's so awesome this is the first fossil evidence in that case of a spider tick interaction which is really cool it's like finding the equivalent of finding bite marks on a bone from a from a crocodile or something we found this is why this is how spiders treat their prey, and we found this little guy. <laughs> it's not certain what kind of spider it would be. 
Uh, you can't tell that just from the silk, apparently. And we don't have a whole lot of good understanding of what spiders eat ticks. Not very much understanding today, it seems, and it's particularly not 100 million years ago when this amber was put down. In the article on Nat National Geographic, it, there are a couple of interesting points, and one of them comes from David Grimaldi, who is a very well-respected paleoentomologist, who said, and I thought that this was an interesting, you know, speculation at how this might have happened. He said, it is quite likely that spider webs were close to cavities in the trees where the little raptors, and he's referring to the feathered dinosaurs at the time, and their parasites resided possibly even stretched across nesting holes. He's suggesting that these spiders were setting up their webs to catch the bugs on the trees, and this tick might have been going after the dinosaurs crawling around on the trees. As we discussed in a not-too-long-ago article, we now have some potential evidence of ticks feeding on dinosaurs, feeding on feathered dinosaurs at the time. So that'd be kind of cool. That would that would explain why this tick was trapped in amber, which comes tree resin, mm -hmm. after being trapped in a spider... Web, which is just the worst day. Yeah. For the also not great for the spider. <laughs> yeah, that, like your, that's your the meal, thing is... your dinner got carried away by Amber. Oh, I wonder. I don't know if there'd be a way to test this or if they mentioned it. I wonder if there'd be any way to figure out if it had already been fed upon. Well, they said the authors pointed out that it's possible this was not prey. Oh, that was like an intruder. Yeah, it seems to have just been caught and wrapped up. As far as I can tell, they didn't find evidence of, of feeding upon it. So it's possible, they said, that this, this tick accidentally ended up in the... Well, it would have been accidental anyway, but, you know, it ended up in this web, and the spider wasn't necessarily typically eating ticks, but it wrapped it up as like a precaution. Oh, you're stuck in my web, I'm going to wrap you up. Yep, it, 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 that's that uh, initial reaction, uh, which I could totally picture. Uh, spiders are actually very meticulous about the care of their web and they will cut things out of it that they don't want in it yes so it's possible so we, we can't say for sure this was prey uh, and we certainly can't say for sure if it was regular spider prey uh, it might have ended up as prey or it might have ended up just kicked out of the nest the out of the web to make room for flies and stuff i, I have this very funny image that i am not suggesting is what happened but i like the concept of the spider was nest was was webbed up near a nest tick was on some little dino that scritched it off fell into the nest spider wraps it up then doesn't want it cuts it free <laughs> knocks it out of the nest and then it just falls into some sap <laughs> it's just like that's that's a lot of rejection in one day <laughs> <laughs> so my my picture was the spider hanging out in the web like I'll, I'll wrap you up and you stay here i'll come back at dinner time and then just this this drop of resin <laughs> Goes over it, and the spider's like, wait, wait, no, I, <laughs> cursed tree. It's just, yeah, as it turns around to get ready for dinner, it turns back. <laughs> yes, it's just behind it. Oh, <laughs> man. Ah, <laughs> oh, shucks. Awesome. All right, so my final news source, uh, going along with the, the nest part of yours and connecting with my last one, has to do with how birds survived a particular asteroid impact that happened about 66 million years ago. You may have heard of it. My goodness, didn't we talk about that in episode five? Yes, I do believe so. <laughs> <laughs> so this also deals with the impact and the after effects of it, but it's focusing on how birds survived it. Much of the birds, I mean, mass extinctions affect everything, but most of the birds did not make it, especially the ones in trees. Yeah, birds, and we did actually mention this in episode five. Last time we'll mention that. That birds, as far as we can tell, almost disappeared completely. They did. They came very close. The thing that this one focuses on is that what may have been the success, what may have made them get through that event was the ones that lived on the ground. The research we're talking about is by Daniel Field et al. in Current Biology. And I'm reading this in uh, BBC News by Helen Briggs. So the impact that we just recently discussed affected all life on Earth, but also plant life. An extreme effect that it had, it was on a near global deforestation, which affected all animals that lived in there. Some of the animals that would have been 
highly sensitive to this would be tree dwelling birds uh, naturally yep if you live in the trees that are deforested then you're not going to do so hot now there's been a question basically as to exactly how did the birds that survived the extinction survive if so many of these birds were wiped out in the forest and we almost lost birds you know what made them make it through to look into this they decided to look at the birds from that time, the fossils of the Cretaceous birds, and compare that to molecular data, inferences from modern birds as to what their ancestry would look like. Yeah, you could do this thing called ancestral state reconstruction, where you look at what are the features we see across birds today? Can we, based on their genetic relationship, can we rewind the story of their evolutionary history a little bit and figure out which of those features would have been present in their ancestry back around the time of the end of Cretaceous. What they found was pretty interesting. Uh, so first and foremost, there were lots of arboreal birds during the Cretaceous. So those were, that was a very common form of life. And so lots of those got hit by the impact, and it shows in their fossil record that they were living in trees, they were built for living in trees, and then the majority of them go extinct. The most successful groups of birds in the Cretaceous go extinct. Exactly, yes. So, I mean, they were dominating and then were wiped out. The molecular data from our modern birds shows that their ancestors likely would have not been arboreal, but terrestrial, ground-dwelling. This suggests a couple of interesting things. So if the birds in the trees are getting hit so hard by the impact, it would make sense that the birds not in the trees might have a better chance. And that's what this... The, these researchers are suggesting is that the birds that made it through the extinction were the more pheasant-like, the partridge-like birds that are spending most of their time in the underbrush, foraging around in the, the tall plants and hiding from predators down there, and nesting down there. And part of what leads them to this suggestion is the fact that their studies show that the ancestors of modern birds from just after that impact would have probably had longer and non-perching legs not legs built for trees legs built for walking over time you see a return to the trees because when trees are available living in trees is pretty darn good way to survive and you see a parallel with as forests return as pollen studies show that the closed canopy you know those dense forests start to actually regrow in the forest in the ecosystems of the earth which took thousands of years, we also start to see a diversity again in tree-dwelling birds. And so they return to the trees, which means, if this is all correct, that the ancestors of most tree-dwelling, you know, nesting birds, which is most birds that we think of today, actually had ground-dwelling ancestors. It also suggests that that small percentage of birds that made it through the end Cretaceous extinction were the ground dwellers. Yes. And that their ecosystem niche allowed them to persist, at least some of them, and then re-diversify and give rise to the birds we have today. Exactly. And so it's it's one of those interesting things where it's not so much to say that ground dwelling is superior to tree dwell to tree dwelling, but in this specific event, it may have been the linchpin to allow us still to have birds today. This is one of those big questions that comes up over and over and over again. Right? Why did the birds that survived the extinction survive? And why, you know, why did any animal that survived? And this is an interesting new suggestion. It's interesting that they've, they've been able to find evidence for it using this, the, the, this approach. So that's interesting. That's cool. It's a, I'm always, anytime this comes up, I always worry because you see the headlines that say like, you know, Scientists figure out why birds survived. Well, no, we didn't. But it's a really no, interesting no. <laughs> idea that is supported by some of our evidence. So that's really interesting. I think the most interesting aspect of it for me is how specific. It's very interesting. Meet such interesting people. If any of you know what that's from, please comment. Because uh, <laughs> it's one of my favorites. It's one of the, the weird things about this, if it turns out to be correct, is how specific to the bird situation it is. You know, that this yeah. is not something that is just like, oh, and they're really good at surviving asteroid impacts. It's <laughs> that specifically the deforestation affected this type of bird in this way, which makes me wonder how many of the other animals that survived had, very, had similar 
specific niches that allowed them to eke through or were affected in a slightly different way because of what they were doing. It, it's it's one of those that it's much more complex than that the Earth just got hit by an asteroid and killed everything. Yes, yes, it most certainly is. Cool. Well, I do believe that that wraps up our news section. That's the news. Which leads us to our main topic. So the question, what is a reef? is one with actually more interesting answer than many people might expect because a it's reef... It's not just a pile of coral? It's not just a pile of coral. It's actually just a or pile... a circular thing you hang on your door at Christmas? No, nope, it's not that either. It is actually, since you use the the term pile of coral, it's more accurately a pile of stuff. Oh. Well, then in that case, I have reefs all over yeah. my apartment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> reefs are a ridge of material, no specification, at or near the surface of the ocean. Oh. So it can really be anything that has built up to form a either very shallow ridge or even breaking above the water. It can form islands. Yes, that I knew. But it can be made of just about anything. Oh. Now, they do have on. some key similarities. Almost all reefs are... Uh, super helpful at protecting coastlines from waves because they're going to break up the energy of the wave. When you know, when a wave travels and rises up, if all of a sudden the ocean bed bumps up, it's going to suck a lot of that power because it's going to impact on that. Yeah, the, like the foot of the wave is broken. Exactly. It, we basi it basically stuff. trips the wave. You know, to, yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty apt way to think about it. Sweep the leg. Yes, sweep the leg, Johnny. The other thing that they're pretty much, this is not always the case, because there's, there's an example we're going to go over where this wasn't, but they're usually places of extremely high biodiversity. They're a structure on what is otherwise for the ocean mostly a barren landscape, a place to hide, and a place for things to take footholds and grow. Yeah, if you think about today, like, the Great Barrier Reef is famous for all the reasons the Amazon rainforest is famous. A huge, huge center of incredible diversity. Reefs are, are one of the highest sources of biodiversity on the planet, only rivaled by things like rainforests. And they also have a ton of other major reasons that they're important, which we will get into later. To more explore the concept of reefs, I wanted to go over the three main types of reef, which is inorganic, artificial, and organic. We'll be focusing on the organic, of course, since we're a paleo podcast, but the first two are still interesting and have very interesting histories, at least for the artificial one. Now, inorganic reefs are rocks or sand structures, sandbars, bunch of rocks, maybe a part of the continental bed that has jutted upward, something that has entered the shallow of the water by rising up from the bottom. Could be build up of sand or just build up of rock. Now these still can promote biodiversity because things can grow on these, and we'll get into that a little bit later as well. Uh, and they can still provide hiding places, but nothing built these other than just geology. Right, right. So that counts as a reef, which is not at all, when you Google reef, that's not what you get pictures of. No, no, that's not, I did, honestly did not know that. I, that was something I learned as well. There's a, I learned a lot in this episode, so I'm excited to share it with you all. <laughs> artificial reefs is where I was blown away. Uh, artificial reefs, as the name suggests, are built by us humans. These are built for tons of reasons, but they can build, be built out of all sorts of different things. In the past, logs, rocks have been used to create artificial reefs. Uh, nowadays, more commonly, you'll probably hear about things like subway cars, old ships, and yeah, yeah. Uh, sculptures. People will make sculptures specifically to form new reefs. Isn't there also a thing you can do where you can like bury yourself in a big concrete sphere? Yeah, you can. That you they can sink to to make the formation of a reef. Put your ashes into what's called a reef ball, and reef balls yes, are yep. the the main type of artificial reef that is usually specifically for conservation. They are designed 
with their innate purpose to promote reef growth because the way they are they the way they work is that a reef ball is not a specific design you could have different versions of a reef ball it's not like it's patented but it is a usually hollow sphere of concrete with holes in it oh okay the type of concrete they use has a a micro adhesive that makes it uh resilient to erosion and also promotes growths of organisms like corals that can then really step up the coral growth there. It gives a really good foothold. But in the time between that, much like sinking a ship that has lots of hollow spaces, the fact that they're hollow gives animals a place to hide in the meantime. So you can start to bring in biodiversity before the reef has actually formed. So a reef, it sounds like the, the unifying features are lots of complexity in the shapes, places for creatures to move through, to grow through, to grow on... Just all this topography for life to take advantage of. That's that's one of the things that you find most common. Now, it's not always the case. We'll talk about one instance where uh, people tried to form a reef and it actually did way more harm than good. So it doesn't Ooh. always – just putting stuff in the water does not always uh, – a bunch of junk does not a reef make. <laughs> um, but the cool thing about a lot of these – reefs is how far back you can see them being used in human society but the big ones we think of today are are mainly for like dive sites and agricultural they can be used to promote fish stocks and things like that uh okay. and then also conservation to try to rebuild habitats if you go back in time you see them used for similar things uh japan has been using artificial reefs for agriculture for you know uh, generations now centuries that they've been used to promote fish but also to grow things like kelp for for consumption and they're kind of one of the ones that are most well known for artificial reefs in human history you know they kind of mastered it usually these would be built out of things like logs that were placed down in structures just off the coast right right my favorite historical use because this did not even cross my mind uh we talked about protecting coastlines from waves well the persians and the romans use oh, them I see where this is going to protect it from evasions <laughs> to sink ships they would put it in the mouths of rivers to either block ships and the romans used it once to trap ships <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah so artificial reefs have a long history and have been used for all the same reasons they're used today, uh, for the most part, but also some that we don't really see them for. I mean, we still see things like putting out uh, uh, things to stop boats from coming into shorelines, but these were military artificial reefs. Interesting. I hate to think of what would happen to all those animals that thought this was a conservation <laughs> reef. Yep. When when the USS <laughs> Coral Killer comes through. <laughs> My new condo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the, uh, the it's, weirdest that's ways. not as funny as, as we're laughing. I know. It's, we have to yeah. laugh or else we cry. <laughs> that's funny, but it's, like, it's not. It's not <laughs> if you can't laugh, you just sit there in silence. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the weirdest ways that we use artificial reefs today that I hadn't considered but it makes sense is instead of to stop waves is to funnel them to make better surfing areas okay yeah, commercial to, uses commercial to make better waves in certain areas to basically channel them in wow so yeah it's it's a long history and then of course the one that we're going to focus on is organic reefs these are reefs built by organisms uh yes typically built up by the laying down of some sort of mineral skeleton where they, as the animal grows, they either leave behind part of their body or after they die, or they are constantly building a mineral structure that lasts after the animal is gone. Now there's tons of variety of this and we're going to go through it, but a couple of terms to go with most of our reef building organisms is that you'll, you'll hear a lot of them referred to as colonial or solitary. And there's specific aspects of these terms. Colonial is the most common form of reforming organisms. And they are going to either be true colonial organisms, basically where 
acting very much like a complex multicellular animal, but the individual parts are actually individual organisms. Corals, sponges, the Portuguese man of war are a lot of really famous ones today that are, if you, you know, for instance, if you were to chop a sponge up, those could reform into sponges because you haven't actually done tissue damage because there's not tissues. They are forming a complex structure with a bunch of buddies. Yes, it's like when you see uh, ants in the jungle form a raft. It's like that, except that the colony is always together like yes, that. Yes, exactly. And that's the other term of colonial that you'll hear is like eusocial colonial insects, which is a, a similar behavior, but not biologically the same thing. They're not physically together all the time. Some of these reef builders fall into that category where they are colonial in the fact that they grow together. They stay close to one another, but they're still separate. And they may be growing on one another, but they're still their own little organisms. So you do have kind of a, a range there. And then solitary is, as it sounds, individual animals that either just grow near one another or grow in the same habitat enough to build up. Right. Like clams. Like clams. And we'll get into uh, our mollusks uh, very shortly, actually. Ooh. So here, here we're going to give you kind of a, a historical view. It's not going to be chronological because that's not how reefs have worked. What you're going to find is that a ton of different groups have built reefs throughout history and still are today. And so I'm going to give you some of the extinct groups that used to do it and a little information about them. So this is just to get us in a little bit of a mindset. And this is sort of, I, I remember learning for the first time that there used to be non-coral reefs Yeah, in the past. When you picture a reef today, uh, folks, you you know, it's corals, uh, corals upon corals, and they are sort of the metropolis under the ocean. But as Will is pointing out, you know, if you think about how many different hard-bodied, hard-shelled invertebrates there are, there's a huge diversity in at different times and places in Earth history. The reef system, the foundation was different organisms. Yes, doing the same basic structure of building up on one another, but completely unrelated to coral. Fascinating. It's like learning there used to be forests that were made out of fungus. Yes, exactly. Which, which honestly, there actually might have been. That's a topic for another episode. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's such an interesting, weird thing to think about. I'm excited to go through this history. Very alien things. Uh, so yes, our first group are some of the earliest, are the Archaeocyathas. And these are most likely sponges. We'll get into that because they're, they're weird. And they're early. These are middle Cambrian to later, or lower Cambrian to Middle Cambrian. So they weren't around for a very long time. It's right. so this really is about... Four or five hundred million years ago. Yeah, we're looking at about 530 to 515-ish million years ago. So not a very long time compared to other groups that we're going to talk about. Right after the Cambrian explosion. This is right after the, that explosion. Episode 9. A few of these seem to have made it to almost the end of the Cambrian, but they basically disappear by mid-Cambrian. And they are actually a very important index fossil for the time. Now, what you're looking at here is a cone-shaped organism, very porous. It had a, an outer cone and an inner cone, cone structure. And from its features is most likely an ancient sponge. But when you're getting to these animals this far back, it could not be. So there, there is not a 100% on... Who it's related for, I believe when I was looking at it, if I remember right, there's actually a question mark to it on its uh, wiki entry. <laughs> on <laughs> sponges? Sponges, maybe? So either sponges or something much like a sponge. Much like a sponge. I would take that as my Cards Against Humanity card to replace bees. Bees? Sponges? They had uh, both colonial and solitary members of this group and were some of the first reforming organisms in the oceans they were built out of uh, carbonates and so basically a, a carbon structure without the focus on the calcium which is what most of the other reefs that we're going to talk about are uh, calcium carbonate or calcium like some sort of calcite base and this actually makes it tricky for their study because they're often preserved in a limestone matrix 
which is basically a limestone uh, surrounding it, which makes it very difficult to separate it for study because they're very similar materials. And so you can't really, you can't separate it chemically because you'll, whatever you do to the limestone, you'll do to the fossil. And it's very hard, hard to chip it out. So most of them have, that have been studied, were already pre-eroded naturally out of the stone that they were in. So there, there's actually a little bit of difficulty in studying them. But these would have been some of the first thing you'd see forming reefs, building off of each other's old skeletons. So if this was in the early to middle Cambrian, we would have seen, you know, these would have been forming the foundations of these underwater complex regions for things like trilobites, early, early trilobites, and the earliest representatives of a lot of our invertebrate groups. Stuff like Anomalocaris swimming overhead, the weird shrimp guy with the claw, with the, with the yep. graspers looking for any little critter. This would have been a reef without fish as we know them. Yeah. Today. Yeah. So all of those brightly colored fish that you think you know, those reef fish. Yes. Would not have been occupying this. So there were reef arthropods probably. Yeah. Reef arthropods and, and possibly a lot of stuff that we wouldn't recognize right off today. A lot of that Ooh. weird Cambrian Burgess shale type weird stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Very, so that's very interesting to, to, to imagine. Now, moving a, a, ahead a little bit and outside of this group, another less well understood early reef builder is the Solenopora algae, which is potentially some of the first ancestors of modern coralline algae, which we will talk about in our modern section, though they were around for quite some time. These are algaes today that lay down a coral-like calcium structure and this early algae was doing a similar thing but slightly differently uh, today they're very knobby in many of their structures though they do have other forms these were much more leafy algaes so you, you what you typically think of when you think of an algae and they had uh unique calcite structures inside their their form that were not making them rigid or quite as hard as you would think, you know, coral building, you know, reef builders like corals and big ancient sponges. You first see them show up around the Ordovician, which begins around 480 million, 480 million years ago. And it lasts actually till fairly recently that most fossil studies show up to the Miocene, actually. Oh, interesting. Which is a long run that ends about five million years ago. Yeah, so fairly recently, and it almost made it to modern times, but not quite. And uh, these played a role in reef building during their time. They may not have been building reefs completely on their own, but uh, much like many algaes today, they probably helped in strengthening reefs during their time. And so these would have been a big component in making reefs a, a structure that would last. Very cool. So we got some early algae. We have some early sponges. Speaking of microbe organisms helping to form reefs and the ancient, ancient stuff, it occurs to me that one group of organisms that would have been reef builders at this time and even before potentially the Cambrian would have been stromatolites. This is true. Stromatolites are, listeners, patches of bacteria and other microbes like bacteria that build up these mounds of sediment underneath them. And these go back, I mean, these go back far enough to points where it'd be hard to think of them as reefs because there wouldn't be organisms to take advantage of them like we see reefs today. Yeah. But I believe there are there are somewhat stromatolite reefs still today. And they're they're building up their structure very much the same way as other reef building organisms. Yeah, they build these mounds that look look like a place. It looks like a place where Goku would fight somebody. Yes, it does. <laughs> ubiquitous rock pillars. Yep, and it's it's that slow accretion of mineral material. Yeah, just like sponges, just like the the algae we're talking about. These are organisms that form mineral structures. Yes. Now the next group is not completely alien for reefs we see today, but is a weird version of it. It's uh, rudest clams. These were the first organisms I heard about that were in corals making reefs. Yes, this is this is one of the famous ones. They get they get a lot of the celebrity treatment. These are mollusks, so 
in the same group as clams and oysters and your shelled invertebrates that built reefs during the late Jurassic to late Cretaceous. So they show up during the Mesozoic and don't make it past that. So we're looking at, for, for some numbers there, 150, a little more than 150 million years ago, up until 70 or so. Yeah, there's, there's some stu studies that show that they may have made it to the KPG extinction, but mostly they, they wiped out before that. Uh, or at least their diversity tanked before that, so there were not many left. Right, right. Now, these clams are not shaped like your typical clams. Uh, so you can't think of that typical equivalent, you know, half and half nice uh, McDonald's hamburger clam shell. <laughs> <laughs> this is a shell where the bottom portion or bottom valve is cone shaped. It is long and shaped very much like an ice cream cone they describe multiple times, while the top is kind of like a lid. Now, those are the famous ones. There were different ones that were much more popular during the Jurassic that were not necessarily reef building. And these are shaped like horn, like a goat's horn, like curved shells that actually laid flat along the sediment. Interesting. So and these were clam-like clam animals. Yes. Both of these were rudists, but the Cretaceous forms, the cone-shaped ones, the ones we're going to focus on because they built reefs. So... Think of them, picture in your head, that ice cream cone with a lid on top. That's very much what these these clams were shaped like. And they would grow in groups with the bottom valve, that bottom shell either rooted in the sediment, sometimes buried where only the top portion may have been exposed, or cemented to another rudest clam, <laughs> building up like that. So when you say the bottom, you mean the point of the cone? Yes, the button. And the then, like, the part the where the ice cream would go is where the lid is. Where the lid of the other valve, the other shell of the clam. So is. they would grow out of the ground and then off of each other? Yep. Just like these, these, like, trees of cones. It's this weird geometric reef. These were very, very numerous during their time. And they ranged in diversity and size. Some of them were a few centimeters, others were up to a meter in wow. size for that long clone that that long cone and would have been once again a very alien looking reef for the time very neat and this now if we're in the jurassic and the cretaceous yes now we're talking about reefs that have fish yep but also ammonites so your mm -hmm. coiled shelled cephalopods episode 16 with the uh, you know <laughs> jet propulsing themselves around and instead of Anomalocaris in the Cambrian swimming overhead, casting its shadow across the reef, it would have been sharks and mosasaurs and plesiosaurs, aquatic reptiles. Better shadows. <laughs> yes, better. And <laughs> marine crocodilians. Yes, indeed. And then. so this this reef may have, even if the you know, the residents were not recognizable to what we see today, would have been probably a much more similar uh biodiverse and vibrant reef than what we would have seen before it. Just the thought of long, pointy clams building reefs is really something. Well, it's It sounds like something designed for a cartoon where they're all just like, boom, 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 like yes. just with their little lids. <laughs> little lids popping up. Yeah, like it, it sounds like a, a aquarium display that's going to blow bubbles. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like it's such a weird design. And I mean, they were most likely filter feeders just like modern clams are. Now, as we move into a more recognizable group. We're going to go into corals, but not modern corals, because there yes. were extinct reef building corals that have not survived to the to our modern seas. So we should explain real quick what a coral is. Indeed. Now, corals are part of the phylum Cnidaria, which include most of your stinging invertebrates. That's kind of their main feature they share. Jellyfish, anemones, and the Portuguese man of wars and other colonial uh, organisms like that also fall in this group. Sea pens are also, we mentioned them when we were talking about our Ediacaran yes, we biota did. that may have been what they looked like. Episode 31. They are characterized by sharing, for the most part, for many of them, uh, nidocysts, 
also called nidoblasts or nematocytes, which are stinging cells that they use to capture prey and for defense, and some more for one, some more for the other. And they're fired from nematocytes or nidocytes. And you'll, these terms you'll kind of hear interchangeably, but if you ever heard of nematocysts, those are those stinging cells that you know we worry so much about jellyfish, and most cnidarians share it. Corals, we see the first, first evidence of corals during the Cambrian about 542 million years ago. But we don't see them start to become more common until the Ordovician 100 million years later. So they are very rare in the fossil record up until the Ordovician, which then we see an increased diversity of corals that start building reefs. They become very common during this time. They start taking over for those archaeocyathids yes. that we talked about in the Cambrian. Indeed. Now, the two major groups that you see uh, during this time and that run pretty parallel to each other are the rugos and the tabulate corals. Yes. And both of which are now extinct. They both lasted up till the Permian. And so about 250 million years ago is when you would see the decline of them and the rise of the modern corals the scleractinia, which is what our modern reef builders, one type of the, mo of the modern corals, but the reef building corals. And we'll get into that when we talk about our modern corals. Before we go into the specifics of the groups, uh, really quick, just on what kind of the anatomy of a coral is, since we will be talking a lot about it this episode, it is our main reef builder today. And for a long time in Earth's history, it was still one of the main reef builders before our modern corals took over. Corals are colonial. For the most part, uh, there are some that aren't, which we will mention, but they are small organisms. And on the ones you're thinking of when, that are building reefs, these organisms are no, referred to as polyps. And they basically look like miniature sea anemones. So little tubular body with a mouth at the end of the tube and tentacles surrounding that mouth, like a flower. When we think of corals, we think of that skeleton mineral structure that they're building around them, but the animal itself is this little squishy flower thing. Yes, and so they squishy, soft, and vertebrate body, but they build a mineral skeleton uh, made of calcium carbonate, which, if that sounds familiar, is what eventually becomes limestone. Yes. And so limestone is built off of the skeletons of corals and other mollusks and other similar calcium skeleton building invertebrates. Yes, it's similar to clams and oysters, where not only a similar material they're building it out of, but again, the, you, what you're thinking of is their mineral shell. The animal itself is the squishy thing inside. Indeed. The tasty so thing inside. The, the anemone is actually weird because instead of having that shell around them, they, actually, they do have an internal calcium structure and then a external calcium structure that protects them, but they still do have fleshy bits on the outside of it. So it's it's very complex, and then really, unless you get a close-up look on them, it's hard to really picture it because they make such complex structures, but they're really not quite microscopic, but almost microscopic organisms building these huge reefs. The corals, and typically, Yeah, corals, yes, yes. Uh, typically, they are still going to be feeding with those tentacles like an anemone does, uh, at night, but many of them today will photosynthesize during the day with algae inside their bodies called zooxanthellae, specific kinds of algae that go to the different species of coral. And these allow them to get food from the sunlight, and then their waste material feeds the algae. So they are symbiotic. Yes, one of the one of the world's most important symbioses. And we'll get into more detail about that because that's still very important in coral today. Uh, some fossil corals may not have had zooxanthellae. That was not something they always had. So there's probably many coral reefs that were not photosynthesizing. And Intriguing. Looking for evidence like that is one of the big things in coral fossil research. But as I said, this is not a coral episode, so we can't go into all the nitty gritty of their <laughs> evolutionary history because... We're only going to be talking about one group of corals here, and there's a ton of them that don't build reefs. Now, the fossil two main groups are the rugose and the tabulate, as I mentioned. Uh, both are comparable in a lot of ways, but also very different. 
in the fact that Rugos includes solitary and colonial versions of coral, which means some lived on their own, some lived together. They were named for the rough texture on the outer surface, which is what rugos means. Uh, you'll hear that referred to lots of like bone features, you know, rugos features on the, the skull of a crocodile and stuff like that. They would form large colonies, uh, very much like reefs today. The solitary ones are the more famous forms of this coral known as horn coral, which you may have heard before because these are very popular fossils. Yeah, they look like little bull's horns or something bull horns or goat horns they're it's due to their shape they form these cones that are typically curved and once again they range in size like our rudos clams from a few centimeters to up to a meter sure. so you can get some big horn corals and very different shape than what you typically see coral, especially since these were the solitary ones so each horn was its own coral and that's not what you usually see today, which is a, a really cool image in my head. Uh, like like Will said, these were one of the two more big deal corals through the Paleozoic era. And if you go through Paleozoic rocks, you see these all the time. In fact, I have seen a number of people in person and online, you know, I'll, I'll see like uh, on online forums and stuff all the time where someone say, I think I found a tooth. I think I found a dinosaur tooth. And you click on the picture and there, that is a beautiful horn coral. That yes, you have it is. There. And so they were, you know, much like corals are today, synonymous with reefs. These were filling that role back then. The tabulate corals were also big reef builders. They were wholly or almost wholly colonial. They had a much wider diversity of structures that they could form. These could make a, a linked, kind of like a chain link form to them. They could also make branching forms, which we see in stuff today. They also had sheet-like growths that would grow and even just mound like brain corals now. And they're named for the internal structures known as tabulae that are these horizontal partitions. So very geometric in their growth. Yeah, they make those hexagonal exactly, like honeycomb yeah, looking yeah. patterns. And so they they were... That was something that the tabulate corals shared with one another, even with their different structures of the overall shape of the coral. Now, as we mentioned, both these, the tabulate and the rugose corals, went extinct during the Permian at the Permian-Triassic mass extinction, one of the, the big ones. So for visual again, because I wasn't planning on doing this, but it's so much fun. Yeah, yeah. These would have been the dominant reef builders that took over from the Archaeocyathids yep. at the end of the Cambrian. And then through the paleo, right, the rise of the cephalopods, the rise of the fish, the rise of land animals, uh, early aquatic amphibians, all that stuff and, and disappeared right before you hit the time of the age of reptiles, the Mesozoic era. In fact, they vanish and our modern corals don't quite take off right away, and it's that time Ooh. period in between where those rudists are doing their thing. That's where they, they find their niche. After that point, we see the rise of our modern corals, the scleractinia, which are the stony or hard corals. That, that distinction is important because, as I mentioned, there's a lot of versions of coral, and some of them are soft, meaning that they do not lay down a mineralized skeleton so they do not build reefs huh. they're still colonial they're still filtering out small or not filtering but catching small organisms from the water column and some of them are still photosynthesizing but not reef builders even if they live on reefs they're not really contributing to the structure of the reef itself so the stony and hard corals are the ones we'll be focusing on they're just loitering yeah they're just squatters <laughs> <laughs> now these, as we said, take over after our previous reef builders and last to the day as the main builders of reefs and our oceans as we see them. They first show up in the Middle Triassic about 240 million years ago, and they are probably not colonial when they first show up. They're uh, most likely solitary, and then become colonial before they start taking over as reef builders. They most likely reached the highest point in their diversity during the Jurassic. 
so mid-Mesozoic. Hmm. And many actually went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. So even though they took over and last till today, much like the birds we talked about earlier, they still were hit hard by that KPG extinction. And it's actually believed that only about 18 of the 67 genera survived. Wow. Yeah, so they got hit hard, but have bounced back. So these are the corals, right? But as the Mesozoic ends, we've lost most of our stony corals. Our mollusk reefs are not dominant anymore. They had their time in the, the Mesozoic. These corals, the stony corals, will be the major reef building organisms for the Cenozoic era. Starting at the, the big dinosaur extinction, which I hate using that phrase, but sure, the dinosaur yep. extinction, yep. all the way 65 million years till today. So now, so now, finally, right, through the Cenozoic, we've got corals building reefs full of fairly familiar fish with event before too long, whales, yeah, dolphins, and then like seals and st I guess reefs seals aren't really but hey, you get what I'm saying. Modern yeah, they, animals they definitely can swimming swimming <laughs> overhead, casting their shadow. Yes, and those indeed. giant sea snakes of the Paleogene we talked about last time. <laughs> oh, I bet they utilized reefs all over the place. Just peeking in and out, slithering yeah, like, around the corals. Like monstrous moray eels just coming out of a hole. <laughs> like just <laughs> feel like a, a nightmare scuba diving. Just all of a sudden, forty feet. Ah! I swear, Paleophis was started coming out of this coral like ten minutes ago. <laughs> There's a star on its tail. You got to wait for it. Yep, yep. You got to watch for it. Now, this is moving into the modern age, and we will be discussing that in more detail and the other animals that continue to help with reef building today. So, modern corals are still the same colonial and reef building polyps, but we can now look into them in a little more detail and how they live today, what they do, and also the reefs they form. Because not only are there different reef builders, there's actually different kinds of reef. Now, most corals you will find in warm, shallow waters. The reason I say it that way is because that's how they word it in one of the shows we do at the aquarium. And I hear it <laughs> in multiple times a week. They, they typically are going to be in tropical waters, shallow, uh, not always at the surface, but near it because they have the zooxanthellae inside that need to photosynthesize. If they get too deep, they will actually get drowned. That's a, it's, if, a, if the water level rise outpaces the growth of the coral, they call it a drowned coral. The reef will die off and the, stop growing. The skeletons will remain there, so it could always prove as a new growth spot later on, but those corals will not make it. They need the warmth, and this is why you find them so often around the tropics in those those rich tropical fish, or the rich with tropical fish and off the coast of many of those uh, warm beaches that people love to go to. So, I mean, it, there's a reason that they're such a popular tourist destination, and we'll discuss because that's actually had an effect on corals in many ways. So... Polyps forming corals, photosynthesizing during the day, feeding at night. This is pretty uniform for most stony corals. They build their calcium carbonate skeletons once again, and they form reefs basically by growing on one another. So they form a coral colony by just all the polyps typically asexually budding, just splitting off into new polyps, you know, cloning themselves. And growing on this structure, they can reproduce sexually. They'll spawn with little packets of an egg wrapped in sperm that then dilutes into the water to go fertilize other corals' eggs. The cool thing about this is actually different species of corals will synchronize that. So a reef will spawn together so that they all have a better protection for each other's eggs so that the fish can't just gobble up one species. Cool. Yeah, so very complex system. They also will grow on dead bodies, as I mentioned. This is, you know, it's a very complex process of reef building because it's not just that they grow up. They grow in all directions. The corals will die and a new coral will land on top of it and start growing there. Corals will kill each other. They do have territorial disputes where they will 
if they get too close to one another, they will attack each other and potentially kill a neighbor to then grow over them. And so it's a constantly changing process. And given enough time, which is talking centuries to millennia, hundreds to thousands of years, they can reach massive sizes. The biggest today, famously being the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia, which has about almost 3,000 individual reefs. You know, smaller reefs making up this huge barrier chain. It includes about 900 islands stretching throughout that area. That covers about 2,300 kilometers, about 1,400 miles long, and an area of 344,400 square kilometers, (laughs) which is roughly 133 thousand square miles it's pretty big huge pretty great huge it's it's great it's a aptly named reef now this is the great barrier reef not because it sounds cool but it's actually a barrier reef that's a type of reef it's one of the ones that you hear about most often but it's not the most common so we are now going to enter into types of reefs yes so these reefs also are growing On top of each other constantly. Yes, absolutely. Reef systems are constantly building up and out. And then so if you you get like a strata of reefs. You get very interesting shapes. You get overhangs. You get and and it'll change constantly throughout its growth. You can get cave systems. You can get columns. And as we said, they can potentially grow to the surface and form islands. And this is something that sometimes you can do in the fossil record. Is, or even with modern corals, is go th- through that growth and get an estimate. You know, with, with modern corals, you can go into the past history of that reef. You can go hundreds or thousands of years back. And in the fossil record, there are some cases, I believe, where you can look at coral systems from the past and get a, an estimate of how old that coral system. Yeah, like how long were they growing? This Cretaceous reef or whatever was here was growing here for 300 years or something like that which is a pretty which is a really cool uh thing to be able to do absolutely and and not only could a reef system be hundreds of years old but a single colony could have a skeleton beneath it that that colony's been building for generations upon generations that is hundreds of years old because there are some very slow growing corals brain coral and mound corals famously if you see a mound coral that's the size of a car that thing's probably thousands of years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like stromatolites. We've talked yes, about stromatolites indeed. a few times, but it's a bunch of a, a packet of bacteria lays down a little layer of sediment, then the next generation grows on top of that, and then the next one and the next one and the next one, and you're just hundreds and thousands of years growing on top of your predecessors. To give you a rough rate of growth. This is this is by no means your average growth but for some of the faster growing corals your branching corals uh, like staghorn and elk horn you typically will see one to two inches of average annual growth and that's about it and so when you see a piece of coral that's you know huge and you know 10 feet across that's a long time that it's been growing they grow at the same rate that continents move Yes, indeed. Yes. <laughs> now they can grow much faster. We'll get into how uh, conservation efforts have actually been able to f- promote coral growth to rebuild reefs. Uh, but typically you're looking at a very slow, st- and that's for fast growing coral. For the slower growing corals, you're not going to see inches in a year. You're going to see centimeters. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a long process. That's also why it's so important that, you know, that's why it takes them so long to rebound from changes in the environment. Yes. We talked about how reefs build to talk a little bit about the different kind of reefs they build that these corals form. There are three main kinds, the fringing, the barrier, and the atoll. And they actually, one can lead to the other can lead to the other, which is kind of cool. So fringing reefs are the most common and what most reefs that you probably think of or see are fall into this category This is a reef growing off a shoreline, so off the edge of a landmass. And basically, they're close to the beach. They extend off from the shore 
and typically will form kind of an overhang at times, but they will have a slightly slanted period of growth from the shore to the outer edge, you know, where the drop off would be for most shorelines. And then it will slant down where the face of the coral reef would be. And so we call, call this the reef flat, which is the back portion toward the shore, and the reef slope, which is the slanted version toward the open ocean. So you have to think of it like it, it's this little edging on the edge of shores. Yeah, yeah. It's characterized by, first off, having almost no deep water or very small lagoon between itself and the shoreline. So basically it's beach, a little bit of water, and reef that just stretches right underneath the water out to a little edge. The back portion often is actually dead. The coral flat is no longer growing because since it's closest to the shoreline, it gets the most effect from runoffs and heavy sediment, which can smother the coral, causing it not to photosynthesize. So the back portion of the coral is actually old dead skeletons, and the front edge, the reef slope, is the actual growing portion. Oh, so it grows out. Yes, indeed. And so it's, it's, like, it's a very slow uh, like explosion ring <laughs> from the island or the shoreline. It can hold smaller reefs within it, the, the, the reef flat area and even grass beds, so it can promote other environments within itself is, like I said, the most common and does all the jobs of protecting from waves. You know, it's going to disrupt a lot of waves coming into that shoreline and is still very diverse. That reef face is where most of the animals are going to be living, where the living coral is and where the uh, the larger amount of surface area. So you have that front area where now you can have overhangs and hideaways and lots of places for, and also where bigger animals can come to interact. You know, sharks can hang out on the edge of the reef instead of in the shallows. Your fringing reefs can lead to a barrier reef. Basically, a barrier reef is exactly the same thing, but now there's a lagoon between it and the shoreline. So it's like a sandbar. It's it's created. There's water behind it, and there's separated a bit from the ocean on Indeed. the other side. So you have island, lagoon, and usually fairly deeper lagoon, so a stretch of deep water, and then reef, and then ocean. You can see how they got the term barrier reef. They're basically like a wall in between the ocean and whatever landmass they're building next to. Now, this could be a fringing reef where the land has eroded away from it and the reef has remained in its original place. Or it can grow mm -hmm. just off the shallow. If there's a sandbar that forms, yeah, it can promote yeah. a reef in a, sh in a random shallow spot that just happens to be away from the beach. So this is an interesting case because here you've got, obviously, your reef is going to be a place for interesting biodiversity, but the reef has also created an enclosed area of water that's going to have its own ecosystem yes. that's going to go. So this, this is two, two ecosystems in one. Indeed. And, and lagoons are utilized heavily, especially as things like nurseries. Yes. You can block yourself off from the bigger ocean where bigger predators could be hiding. And so very popular with many animals and uh, very important for human civilizations as well. Fishing areas. Uh, it's where Moana's family refuses to leave at the beginning of the movie is the lagoon in between the reef and the island. Yeah, the so lagoon's the safe place. Mm -hmm. Once you get beyond that, there's the waves and sharks violent, and sea monsters. Giant uh, coconut crabs. It's monstrous. You gotta, you gotta um, watch out. <laughs> Now, an atoll is the next step. This is a, effectively a barrier reef, but with no island that it is guarding. And they form a circle around a lagoon. So now you have a reef in a circle, the lagoon in the center, but no landmass inside it. And the, the cool thing about these three is that atolls typically form around volca undersea volcanoes that have risen up and formed an island on the surface, which promotes a fringing reef around its edge. But as the volcano dies, the volcano itself will erode quicker than the reef and will start to erode away. And as it shrinks, you now have a barrier reef where the fringing reef was in, around a now smaller island. And then eventually the island will disappear completely and you now have an atoll. 
So you have a seamount. Yes. Under the water. So it's a, it's a it's a patch of land that's no longer breaking the water surface, but it's supporting a reef that is now creating a barrier around nothing, around just the the water within. Darwin actually hypothesized that this th- these sea mounts would exist under you know beneath atolls because of uh, how they must have formed, and so there's some been some cool history to the discovery of the the formation of atolls. There's something so fascinating about studying organisms that are building on geologic timescales. Yes, that's the thing is that they are at the same speed as most mountains. <laughs> like you're building your these structures over hundreds to thousands of years. Yeah. Which makes them the, these time capsules of history. They're very, very popular places for people to explore into the past. And atolls can be very unique. Because like we mentioned, the lagoons between a barrier reef and the shore are as a whole new environment uh, compared to the open ocean. This is now that whole new environment but just smack dab in the open ocean. Yep. So you can get this really cool difference between the animals inside the atoll and the animals outside the atoll that can sometimes be isolated from one another if the atoll is 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 complete enough, which is cool. It's, it's, it adds <laughs> that time capsule feature, which I really like. The There's a one other type of reef that is uh, not as common, but it, it's very similar to the barrier reef in some ways it's called a platform or table reef and you don't typically see it in the listing they typically only talk about the first three but this is when a reef forms completely unrelated to a shoreline where there was just a shallow area somewhere in a shallow sea that was close enough to the surface that corals could land and grow and so it can be just a reef on its own Uh, not as common as the others Shorelines are by far the most common because there's land above the water, so obviously there's shallow water. But it can happen without a shore being nearby. Those are the main types of coral reef and some of the main ways coral forms reefs. Now I'd like to talk about some of the other kinds of modern reefs because there are types of reefs today outside of the corals or organisms that help building reefs that are not corals that I wanted to discuss a little bit that are under recognized and are still very cool and unique animal or unique habitats. Yeah, so even today it's not just corals contributing no, to reefs. They they would like to have you think so. But yes. no. There are so the the first one that's probably the the most underwhelming so we'll we'll pat we'll go through it is back to when we talked about the fact that there are natural inorganic reefs that are just rock outcroppings mm-hmm. and ridges that form shallow areas. These can become what's called a live bottom reef, where instead of being built up by organisms, it's just rock. But now the rock has been covered with sea anemones and sea grasses and sponges and sea pens and all sorts of other anchored organisms that are not building onto the structure, but are using it the same way they would be using a reef. And you can get a ton of biodiversity there as they start to carpet this rock face. Cool. Yeah, so you get it's kind of like think of it like moss growing over a rock or a, a yeah, stony yeah. face. It's the same concept, but all sorts of squishy organisms. The weird one is coralline algae. Now, not coralline like the movie, but <laughs> like coral forming. Uh, these are algaes that we mentioned earlier that put down a same a cal- calcareous deposit as it grows that can form reef-like structures, but more importantly, actually strengthens modern reefs. So you will typically find corallines, uh, coralline algaes growing among reef systems. Before we get into what they do, there's two different kinds. The articulated, which have branching, more tree-like organisms, but non-calcified, so not reef building. The non-articulated, which are like encrusting, they leave behind these really bumpy, they're slow growing, they're rugose they're very just like knobby and and they form these you know kind of lattice works with small spaces inside but not plant looking it's it's very it looks like a a bunch of cement got poured off to the side and just took a weird shape these are the corals that these are the algaes that help with reef building alongside the corals 
And they're the ones that really do those important jobs to help the health of the reef. First and foremost, they are a major cementer of the reef. They can help fill in the spaces of dead corals and solidify the reef itself. Coral, even though it's strong, still has lots of spaces in it that can weaken it. You can actually break coral quite easily when it's on its own. But this can kind of fill in those gaps in between the corals and strengthen it, cement it together. Interesting. And so it's very important for making a coral reef lasting to make sure that it will survive the harsh waves and last through the ages as a barrier to the shore and as a habitat. It's it's your um your backup to the coral for building it. It also, which I think is really cool, is a competitor for other algaes that would otherwise smother the coral. Ah, so it's like a protector. It's like a protector. Algaes are one of coral's uh, biggest threats. Things like hair algae, green algae, even things uh, like diatoms and mat algaes can do that as well. Basically, if they grow over a coral, they'll smother it. It won't get sunlight, and they will outcompete it like vines growing over a tree and covering it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And blocking its like source kudzu. of the sun. Exactly. Kudzu's terrible at that. This algae tends to outgrow those threatening algaes. It also occupies the real estate they would be going for. And most importantly, many of them have a chemical defense to fight off these threats. So they actually act like a bodyguard. Very nice. So it's it's a, a, another one of those symbiotic setups. Not the same algae that are living right alongside the coral, but they're building... Yeah, not actually within. Yes. But filling those gaps in between and strengthening the reef. Very cool. Very popular among uh, reef enthusiasts who keep home aquariums. So Makes you'll sense. see them very big mention in there. One other one is oyster reefs. We still have mollusks forming reefs, oysters growing on oysters. They're often called oyster beds. And these are very common around coastal areas in... Chesapeake Bay is probably one of the most famous ones you'll hear about. Yeah, the Northeast United States has a very, very long history of oyster bed uh, exploitation by us people. Indeed, and, but it forms reef systems that also promote a lot of other animals to grow there, especially things like crabs and stuff that can uh, live around it when the tide goes out. But they're also very important for filtration. Uh, and these are oysters like we know oyster, like, you know, shell what what did you say before you uh, you you were, uh, the the McDonald's the hamburger McDonald's clamshell hamburger yeah yeah that. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that, so these are yeah your modern oysters if you've ever had oysters at a seafood restaurant those can form reefs very cool this is not a different kind of reef but it's a weird one but it is the Amazon reef which is one that was discovered not too long ago and is very different from other coral reefs. Interesting. Is it made of uh, really impressive women who have lassos and swords yes, and wear yes. bracers around their arms? <laughs> that's, that's the Amazonian reef. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I'm thinking of a different thing. <laughs> this is a coral reef that's off the coast uh, of South America, actually at the mouth of the Amazon River as it enters the ocean. Oh, okay. Interesting. Now, rivers typically cut paths through reef systems so if you had like a fringing or barrier reef as it was going along the shore it typically breaks and then begins again on either side of a river mouth because rivers are sediment heavy and as we mentioned sediment kills coral yeah and it's fast it rushing water and yep it is, yeah. and it's different chemistry fresh water entering in and coral is very finicky about their chemistry yeah and so it typically is just not a thing you expect to see but in 2012, a reef was discovered actually underneath the opening of that river system. Wow. And it's super weird. So they had gotten hints, like locals had said stuff and things they had caught had been, there had been like hints and evidences that there might be a reef down there. And they finally got confirmation. And then now, and I'll link it in the, the blog post, we have tons of awesome images of the reef that's down there. So we finally gone down to look at it. This is the worst environment for corals in so many ways. It's a low <laughs> oxygen, low light, and tons of sediment. All of three of which are typically 
deadly to coral. But they noticed that what they found is that the current of the river is actually strong enough and the waters are deep enough outside the the mouth of the river that it actually carries the sediment over the coral. And it doesn't actually settle much on the reef itself. Ah, so they found a little place where all this it's like hide it's like living behind the waterfall. Exactly, exactly. Like a like a wind tunnel where there's the the dead space where no wind is making it in. There are parts of this reef that have been going living without light for years now. And and they still have a ton of animals living down there. Lots and lots of reef fish, mostly new reef fish, different kinds. So it's a very unique environment, but still very vibrant. The thing this really shows us about reefs, and this is going to lead nicely into our conservation topic, is that they can survive in situations we did not think they could and are potentially more hardy, or some of them at least are, than we would typically be led to believe. So there may be a lot more for us to learn about coral reefs and what they're capable of. Very cool. So we've so reefs, 500 plus million years of reefs yeah in all sorts of forms and all sorts of places uh include and still and still dominating the world today which is something that's oh, really you know that the, this is a form of ecosystem structure that became popular at at the latest in the cambrian right at latest in the cambrian if not before and has just been a, a major shaper of ocean ecosystems it's a good way to build habitats. Yeah, minus those pulses right after mass extinctions. Yes. Yeah, this is this has been it's like uh, again, it's like forests. Yeah. Like once the once plants invented forests, th there have been forests. We have had forests all over the place ever since. Speaking of pulses after mass extinctions, to talk about the situation of modern corals, We've gone over, corals are extremely important. Biodiversity is a massive importance to them. It's estimated that between 600,000 to more than 9 million species worldwide reside in reef habitats. They protect shorelines. They promote agriculture, as we mentioned. Oxygen production is an extremely important part of how they affect the ecosystem. The zooxanthellae are algae that produce oxygen just like other algae. And so without corals, we would have much less oxygen to breathe. Tourism is an important part for a lot of countries. In fact, it's been estimated through all of these different benefits that at least, I believe it was US was what this study was focusing on, um, but I'll link the article. It's been estimated that about $172 billion annually is attributed to the benefits of coral reefs. Wow. So it's like they are super important to not just the health of the earth, but our economy. But they are threatened on all faces. Uh, natural threats, storms, predators. There are coral eating animals, parrot fish and sun stars and things like that. Other corals, as I mentioned, can kill one another. So they do have natural threats. Being broken up by a big storm can destroy an old reef without any help from something unnatural. Yeah, coral reefs uh, maintain that sturdiness under constant pressure from the things around them in the world. The one thing that they've not been able to defend again is our multiple uh, infringements. Overfishing is the most obvious, uh, destroying just the habitat and ecosystem, but that also includes bottom net trawling, where we drag nets across the seafloor yes. and just can etch a, just, just like, like etch a sketch wipe. Yeah, it just tears it tears through it. Just just completely destroy it. Pollution is a big one. Of course, chemicals can kill it, but ocean acidification is one of their biggest worries, and this also affects a lot of mollusks. Basically any hard skeleton a hard mineral skeleton building organism that uses calcium carbonate is gonna be affected by carbonic acids, affected by the amount of CO two in the atmosphere. So the more CO two, the more acidification of the ocean, the harder it is gonna be for these organisms to build strong skeletons. So you get a lot of that. There's a really tragic case of the Osborne Reef, which was an attempt by uh, Fort Lauderdale here in Florida to create a artificial reef right off their coast by putting down a lot of discarded tires. But the tires were not s held down correctly, and they just washed away as 
consecutive storms and surfs have come through uh, and have actually done damage to other reefs by colliding with them oh, and sh- have just caused general pollution with tires floating up. I think some of it even reached other countries due to hurricanes. So like there's been bad attempts to make reefs before where it was just not quite, not quite up to the snuff. Oops. Uh, and then climate change, of course, the change in temperature can cause something called coral bleaching, which is when the zoosynthelic algae inside the coral abandon ship because the water's not to the, the quality it needs it to be. And the corals go white because they've lost their color. That All their color comes from that zoosynthelic. And they can get it back if it's brought, if the conditions return soon enough. But otherwise, that coral is going to die. Yeah, the algae just hop out. Just hops out. Just leaves into the water column Too to hot. go find better, better uh, corals somewhere else, hopefully. Yeah, they, 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 it's something they can do that the corals cannot. Yes. Just up and move. And then finally, the most obvious one is tourism with people touching and stealing and breaking <laughs> coral by yeah. walking on it and stuff. It's the most direct cause. And I think the thing that's that's really striking about the threats that coral faces today are a, as you've demonstrated that they come from many directions. Yep. Ocean temperature, ocean chemistry, pollution, things like that. But every one of these effects that weakens a reef leaves them susceptible to all the natural threats that you mentioned before. Indeed. So coral that is struggling with, even if it's just slightly higher temperature, slightly more acidic waters, well, they also have the parrotfish and the starfish and the occasional storm, and that's that's really the killer. Yeah, they don't have a a, a mutual like com, you know sportsmanship like respect. Yes, the parrotfish <laughs> like, are uh, like, look, you're going through a hard time. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go over to this reef. Yep. And it you know it. it Living in nature is not easy to do. Every new threat makes it that much harder. There is a silver lining, so I don't want anyone to be in the episode depressed. Uh, (laughs) We are doing a lot of things to try to protect coral. There's tons of organizations. The Coral Restoration Foundation is one of the big ones here uh, in Florida, in the Keys, that are working on rebuilding and regrowing. Things like reef balls, protective legislation are all big parts in protecting reef habitats. One of the cool things we can do is something we actually do at uh, the Florida Aquarium, as well as a number of other aquariums in Florida and Cuba and uh, other tropical places with reefs nearby, is to grow coral in greenhouses. What? It's really, really neat, because basically we go down to the reef, break off a couple of chunks of coral very carefully, and... Since it's colonial, that chunk can start growing all on its own as long as it's given what it needs. And so we're effectively cloning that colony and making a a colony of the exact same polyps, but we can glue them down to these concrete blocks, put them in a greenhouse, give them perfectly clean water, perfect amount of food, perfect temperatures, perfect water chemistry, and they grow like crazy. Cool. So you can, we've, we also use a technique of hanging them upside down which there's not really an upside down to a coral, but when you hang it, the heavy part will go down and they'll now be pointing away from the sun. And that actually encourages them to grow faster to get back up to the sun. And so it's just a way to trick the coral into growing faster, basically puts them into a panic mode Yeah, and they will grow up at max. Our best year of growth was about 10 inches in one year. Wow. (laughs) So major speed up from that one to two I mentioned earlier. And then these corals can be sent back to the reef and glued back down. There's even projects looking into coral spawning to keep the genetic diversity, you know, in human care, coral spawning in a greenhouse that will keep the genetic diversity up so that we're not just cloning the same coral that might get sick. And doing tests, basically simulating future ocean conditions in the greenhouse to find out which corals should we focus on that will survive those conditions better so that the reefs at least stick around with hardier cor- corals for those warmer and more acidic times. This is th- this subject, the, the discussion about preserving coral reefs is always very, it's uplifting and it's depressing. Yes. Because the reason that there are so many people around the world pushing so hard for this is that coral reefs are so important. As we've said this entire episode, every time you have a reef system, it becomes a haven 
for tons and tons of other life. And you remove that and you've lost a lot of the homes for your biodiversity. Even the thing that you just mentioned about prioritizing which coral to protect is, well, that's wonderful and uplifting, but it's also sort of that mindset of which ones have we already kind of lost? Yes, which ones cannot are not going to make it? Yeah, you no, know, they, they we can still have them in aquariums and we can still have them in human care, but there's some that it it would be almost pointless to keep growing because yeah. if things continue the way they are, they're just going to die off again anyway. And this is where the geologic perspective is always <laughs> nice <laughs> and comforting to think that corals have hit hard times. Different yes, types. I mean, we lost entire types of reef building corals in the past, as we mentioned. Different reef builders have come and gone. I don't doubt that whatever happens to our coral reefs today, in the future, other organisms, maybe corals, maybe who know, maybe snails. Snails might be the, you know, who knows what. Oh, that'd be so cool. Who's going to take over the reefs in the future? Uh, whether or not they will look like what we have today and whether or not we will experience a very, very depressing dark period before that happens, hopefully we can push our conservation efforts to prevent that from happening. But yeah, we we are we are in a it's a rough patch. It's not even a dark period; it's a white period. All those bleached yes, corals. It is. We're yes, in a rough patch is. after six hundred million years of corals dominating the oceans. Indeed. So that is about going to wrap up our discussion of coral for this episode, I, uh, and reefs for this episode as well. Uh, like I said, it's hard for a discussion of reefs not to become a coral episode, but <laughs> if you'd like to hear more about either of those or any of the coral builders we mentioned, please let us know. There's tons more about this subject. Always willing to dive deeper. But before we wrap up fully, one more thing, one last thing, a Patreon question. Yes, one of the benefits that our patrons can take advantage of is that they get to submit questions for us to answer on the podcast. It happened once, a long yes. time ago. Dylan had a question for us that actually plays very nicely into our most recent episode. He said, he asked, how do you guys feel about the mammoth cloning project? Do you think it's ethical or even possible? This is interesting because it made when we when I saw this I realized that we talked for all of episode thirty five about de extinction, but never took the time to give our personal thoughts on it. <laughs> no, he didn't. So this is a great opportunity to do it. Dylan's question it, it basically is: Do we think mammoth cloning is possible, and do we think it is ethical? From my perspective, my answer to this question is cloning. Maybe not. Like we discussed last time, cloning is a little bit wonky. But honestly, I do think we will see some sort of mammoth de-extinction soon-ish, within the next, you know, several years to a couple of decades. Uh, Dr. Beth Shapiro, who knows a lot more about this than I have, wrote a book about it, in fact, has said that we have the technology and we have the determination and we have a long history of making things that we want to happen happen. Yep. And I tend to agree with her. I think that it's going to happen. One way or another, uh, something like this is going to happen. Ethical is a different question. There's a lot of ethical things to consider. For me, the one that I focus on, and I think the the thing that's most interesting to me, is the ethics of the fact that these are elephants and that elephants are really hard to work with. Yeah. Uh, elephants don't typically do well in captivity. Elephants are extremely endangered. Right? All elephants today are, are under extreme threats and, and endangerment. Elephant gestation is two years, so every experimental baby pseudo mammoth that we want to grow, like to see if it works, is two years. I think yeah. that I think that the, the for me and I, I'm, there are people thinking about this. This might not end up being a big ethical deal. You know, we, we, we they, by the time we get there, this is a ways off. We might have come up with some really great solutions, but for me, the first things that come to my mind ethically are that. This is a lot of pressure and a lot of stress to be putting on a group of animals that we already have a bit of a poor history working with, that are already struggling, and that have a hard enough time making a baby in the first place. <laughs> I I would tend to agree on all those factors. Uh, I definitely think that we probably will see something happen with it. 
Uh, I don't think it'll be a true clone, but some form of genetic editing is probably very likely. The ethical part of it is much more complex. I agree with everything you were saying, is this is a, a complex thing with animals that are not going to be the easiest to do it with. But also, I worry that this might be a distraction for many people in that, or a, or a deception, or a misdirection. Some Some aspect of the fact that even if we explain as hard as we can that we're not actually bringing back a true mammoth and that because it was raised in a modern world by elephants and maybe partially people with no other mammoths to live around and none of the other animals that it would have been living around and not the exact same ecosystem and climate that even if we try to put it somewhere that's very similar that you're not real you can't learn about what a mammoth was like no matter how hard we try to explain all those things, people are going to still see it as the mammoth. And I worry that that's going to be a... It's it's sort of like when you when you have a big sweeping statement about a popular dinosaur gets made, that that's all people are going to remember for the next decades and focus on just the aspect of the mammoth that came back and not the fact that it wasn't really a mammoth. I, I, I worry about it that it's going to be... Uh, even if it's not the intention, that it effectively will have the side effect of just being a publicity stunt for a cool experiment, but not really driving home what actually is happening. Now, whether or not all these things come into play, obviously we're not the only people worried about these no. things. Uh, it may turn out when it, this is years and years off, if it happens at all, maybe it'll be totally ethical by that time when we finally get around to figuring out how to do it. Yeah. Time, time will tell. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks for asking us a Patreon question. Hey, patrons, if you have questions, you if, if, hey, if it says on your level that you can ask us questions, if you got that little message that says you can ask us questions, please do. You can do it. So thanks for th thanks to Dylan again for that. And that is now going to be the end of this episode. We are going to wrap things up and say, as we usually do, please feel free to contact us about subjects in this episode. If you have questions about the reef stuff, if you have parts of it that you'd like to hear more about if you have comments if any of you have uh, your own views on reefs or reef conservation share them we'd love to hear it you can contact us on all the social media we have links in the blog post and everywhere else you can contact us on the blog after this our next episode will be coming out in two weeks as it typically does but also keep your eye out for the next Jurassic series episode. Yes. Yes. And and thanks again to Carly for requesting. Thank the you. Episode. Thank you. I was like, there's something I'm forgetting. <laughs> and thank you to Carly for suggesting this episode. This was a lot of fun. I learned a ton. There's a lot of information here. Sure was. Uh, we hope so you did thanks too. Thanks for leading us down this path. Yes. More sciencey stuff next time. See you then, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.